Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about quite a wide-ranging, uh, a lot of information that we've gathered over quite a long time, but also give it a bit of perspective with modern technology that we're using more and more as we've as come out in the talks, which is very refreshing to see. One thing you've got to remember is in, in the traditional way of finding out what was going on inside animals, such as sharks, was to actually open them up once they'd been caught and killed, and uh, pulling out bits and pieces such as stomach contents, uh, and finding all sorts of hooks and stuff. But the other interesting thing is obviously you can find out various aspects of reproduction and so forth, so there's a lot to be said for necropsies, and by no means are they outmoded. They are complementary to these other techniques. And they start giving you baseline information, uh, provided you look at some details of what they're feeding on. A lot of people use just like it was a fish or a bird or something in the stomach, and obviously you're, it's a very coarse resolution of how predation is going on in the wild. However, if you use things like oatless, oatless have unique shapes for each different species, and furthermore they grow as the fish grows. So you can identify not only what prey species are taken, but you can estimate the size of the prey, which can be useful for changing diets with size uh, as a predator grows bigger. <coughs> one of the limitations, of course, is that these two, although being the, one of the last things that remain in stomachs, they are ultimately digested. So you're looking at history uh, of predation. Uh, one of the better things to use for cephalopods are beaks. Each different cephalopod species, this is a large <coughs> beak, it's actually a mouse and part. They uh, resemble <coughs> bird beaks, hence the name. But uh, again, not only can you identify different species, uh, you can get a measurement of the beak size and estimate the prey size. Uh, so again, you're getting a bit of history as opposed to just saying in general they're feeding on squid or sharks or whatever. You can actually identify the prey and get some idea of where they might have been hunting. And then, of course, you use normal standard things of curves to prove that you haven't got enough data, you didn't kill enough sharks, but you live with that. Uh, of course, most of this information is obtained opportunistically from, in the old days, shark competitions and fishing competitions. They used to kill the sharks, so we used to f uh, get the data opportunistically. In the same way, the marine mammal folks get information from strandings, and occasionally get shark strandings too. So, so over time, you can collect information, and you get this thing of a wider range of size and prey taken by this is a rabbit tooth shark, and a change of diet, uh, for example, uh, elasma breaks taken more commonly by the large sharks. So these are patterns that are repeated. But they are snapshots of reality, and you don't really know where they were hunting, how much energy they spent, uh, and how, what they went through to try and get their diets. One of the things we started working on a long time ago, hey Dale, uh, was uh, on the squid aggregation sites. And that was, for me, that was a revelation because <coughs> squid aggregation sites are very active. Uh, there's a whole lot of sex going on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This is a female, this is a male. Basically, it's fascinating and very, um, you can gather a huge amount of data just observing and filming interactions between males and females and mate guarding and color pattern changes, body pattern changes, and so forth. And that was fascinating, but I was particularly interested in predation events. So, Again, you can get a certain amount of information uh, observing and so forth, but ultimately you need to actually get the films. And things like, as we've heard earlier, goes, pros, and other filming techniques are improving our knowledge. And you can actually observe a shark feeding on a squid. This is a, as a consequence of a squid being eaten. <laughs> and that was uh, too late. Whoops, I try to put out my defense too late. Okay. What did I press you on? Okay. Um, this is actually an interesting shot. Well, unfortunately, this is one of Charles Maxwell's brilliant uh, shots, which doesn't do it justice as a frame grab from a, a movie. No, it was before the 3D days. 
But what you can see there is actually that's the front, the, the jaw of the shark that is extended just prior to the actual bite. So the sharks actually grab the, the prey like that and the jaws uh, become separated from the skull and they're able to grab their prey with those oar like teeth. <coughs> so by getting in underwater and by forming and having the opportunity to analyze post hoc, you get a huge amount of information. And this is something we were trying to work out what was going on and basically you can, this is a plotting uh, deposition of eggs, the females go down, lay the eggs, uh, and then come up again. And when they're close to the egg beds, there's these fronds of all the previous eggs being, egg fronds being laid. Um, they're actually in a vulnerable position for that time because predators can get up on them. So they spend very little time there. But the egg laying can be disrupted. In this case, that was uh, night time. Divers have, can have an effect, usually they don't if they're careful, but if you're changing equipment and disrupting the behavior. This was filmed with an old fashioned camera probably about 15, 20 years ago. And the technology again, as we've heard today, is going ahead. And these were observations of disruptions. And these are various predators moving over the beds, disrupting the uh, squid egg laying. And essentially that what we found is if the predator moves slowly, uh, the squid kind of just ease off gently and then remember the main focus of their lives, they're coming to the end of their lives, is to get their reproduction done. So they're very focused on sex. And uh, egg laying and competing with each other to get successful, successfully mated. So this is hugely uh, time sensitive activities. So they don't want to waste energy rushing out the way if this is where they want to be. And they will respond depending on the speed of the predator. This is actually busy mating in the water column, uh, and depending on the predator, the predator charges up, and these little guys, these are spondalia sama, attack them, and these uh, squid will jet out, and they actually spit out the spermatophores sometimes, and the squid will eat up the, sorry, the fish will eat the spermatophores. But the interest, and these guys are pajama sharks, which lie in the egg beds and surprise the squid because they just lie still and then they'll ambush the squid as they come down. But what was very interesting, whereas uh, these guys are off for seconds essentially, a couple of minutes maybe, when the seals or marine mammals come around the squid are gone, which would suggest that these are seen as much uh, greater threats. And one of the things we did was have a this was a bit of a drunk navigator, but we were essentially trying to survey the, the egg beds. And uh, this must have been Roberts driving out this. <laughs> but anyway, the point was that despite the slightly inaccurate uh, navigation, I think we didn't have uh, GPS in those days. The point was that the predators were all focused around the egg beds. So it gives you an idea that obviously the predators are there focusing on these uh, short term events. I must thank Doug Perrine for these images. Um, another focused activity that people are aware of in South Africa, but ha perhaps not widely, are the sardine runs. And anyone going on a sardine run must realize these kind of instances happen very rarely. So if you pay or whatever it is, you're not going to see one of these every day you go there. But nevertheless, when you do see them, they are predators focusing on a, a highly available bait ball at that time and the behavioral changes between the sardines moving up the coast and then being corralled into these bait balls where they're trying to avoid predation is another fascinating thing and we still haven't got the technology I believe to fully analyze these and it's something that we need to keep working on but again the predators are focusing multi-species aggregations feeding on highly available prey so it's a similar thing but in many ways very differently. These uh, sardines are, are not aggregating to spawn. In this instance, they're actually still moving. They haven't got around to spawning. Whereas in the squid, they are busy spawning. So they're not aggregated in the same way. We've also heard how white sharks change their prey as they get bigger. This is one of the classic uh, illustrations. I actually can't remember where it's from at the moment. But essentially, as we know, you get scavenger as the sharks get bigger. And in a nutshell, juveniles generally feed more on uh, other fishes. And this is illustrated very clearly in the dentition where the juveniles have almost 
dagger-like teeth, whereas the large ones get broader, and there's been a couple of recent publications showing how much the strength of the jaws increases with size, and juvenile sharks just don't have a powerful enough jaw to attack, oh, sorry about that, to attack uh, things like seals <coughs> until they get big enough. And then you've got these classic things, and we were talking about seals earlier. These are the guys that didn't get away. These are the doofies. <laughs> so, uh, but these are classic images one's seen. Uh, and there have been some neat papers looking at some of the theory, and one of the nice things now is coming into marine research these days is trying to look at ecological theory and predation theory and match them with some of the events that we're observing. And that's a very encouraging way. Um, and also some of these behaviors we know from things like Venco tags and VRAPs and so forth. There's a lot more real-time data being gathered on these kind of events in addition to the photographic and video stuff. Okay, I'll move on. Okay, so uh, <coughs> the prey of the sharks, as we know from various studies, has changed. And again, looking at stomach contents and using beaks, you can get an idea of what, how the predation changes. You get ideas that they've some white sharks are feeding inshore, but they move offshore as they get bigger. A more recent study, which is a very nice study, combining, uh, this is looking at different prey types. This is a size at which uh, seal predation becomes more common. Uh, and looking at stable ice tail, which is another way of looking at predation, it gives you some idea of how it's changing through time um, and how Signatures that you get from stable ice types can give you a lot of information of where the animals are feeding and what levels of on the trophic scale uh, they're feeding. So I'm sure I don't have time to go to that right now. And then new approaches are putting on cameras onto uh, animals. So this is Alison Cook, thanks for the images. And you can get an idea of uh, predation on a dolphin or attempted predation on a dolphin and on a seal there. So, these technologies allow you a much better and closer insight into activity. Pat tags similarly give you some idea this is daylight here and then this is movement. Essentially you can get a lot of information about their diving behavior that was alluded to earlier related to hunting for scent or whatever it is to prey. Again putting on critter cams onto these sharks. Again we use students to attach them. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but you can get unusual concepts and ideas of how animals are reacting to either humans or their prey. And these devices are getting smaller. Uh, this ended happily. Everyone didn't even know the shark was there. And this guy was doing a bottom that basically hunts on the bottom and then move up to the surface, look for divers, go down again. Um, but essentially, it gives you a shark's perspective of, what, of hunting behavior, which is a huge increase uh, of knowledge compared to just opening up um, sharks and looking at stomach contents. And they complement each other in many ways. And this is a, um, I think it's a Nakamura or Tanaka, used a combination of accelerometers and video to try and uh, understand swimming behavior, hunting behavior, and actual predation events. So the movement pattern and data analysis is coming along. What's going on? And when we get movement patterns, we make assumptions about what's going on. Are those animals resting there? Are they hunting there? And when you've got aggregated prey, you're most likely to be right. This thing. Oh, you still? <laughs> you're trying to rush me. Hang no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when patchy prey is available, the interesting thing is, is time scales. Uh, seals are there for months, short months, a uh, few months. Squids are days, pilchers minutes, perhaps days. Uh, and then the responses of the predators must obviously vary uh, depending on their prey. And the environmental influences need to be factored in. All these things we never had a chance to look at before, but now with the new technologies, we can get some idea. So new technologies, fortunately, they're smaller and cheaper. New approaches to data analysis, some of which we've heard today. 
are giving us much greater insights. Hypothesis testing, as again has been alluded to, a critical part of planning the work. And uh, complementary studies are essentially the only way to go. Oh, and then as uh, time goes by, I'm sure multi-parameter <coughs> equipment will become more commonly used. That's it. Thank you. Another great <laughs>